This fall during hunting season, I was getting a slice of pizza at a general store in a small town in the mountains of Western Maine. And I was standing in line and I ran into a guy I know, a guy I like a lot, called Esau Cooper, who was a local excavator. And he said, I've been watching you, interviewing all these people. Why don't you interview me? Well, I got interesting stuff to say. And I thought, you know, I bet he does. Esau Cooper is an interesting person. Esau Cooper is not only a good, upstanding citizen of his town, to remain unnamed, uh, in the Western Maine Mountains, but he's also the local lawnmower racing champ. Every year, this town in August has a lawnmower race, and Esau Cooper often wins it, sometimes at great personal risk. Here's a video of it. Esau is the one in the green John Deere that runs into the camera. Lawnmower racing is one of those things you make fun of as a curiosity, an oddity for rural areas until you see it. And then you realize these guys are legit automotive engineers and they have major stones. It's dangerous. That video, by the way, shot by Toby Winsel. Esau Cooper, the man on the green John Deere, joins us now in studio. Esau, it's great to see you. Good to be here. I wasn't joking. <laughs> um, so first, the lawnmower racing, like how fast do those go? Uh, the sky's the limit. It depends on how fast you make it go our particular track in andover we uh 25 30 miles an hour is probably too fast to make turn one so not particularly fast but because the track's small and tight it looks yep. like you're flying you know it certainly does i've seen it the straight stretch is only 100 feet long so if you gear your track to a pull for 100 feet yeah you're good well so how do you get a ride on mower to go 30 miles an hour change the pulleys and get rid of the governor how do you get rid of the governor? You just unhook a few springs and pull it back. And so the, the motor turns, pushes as fast as it can all the time. It's it's not good for longevity of the motor, but it's yep. <laughs> yeah. Could you do that in any vehicle? You can get rid of the governor? On a lawnmower engine, yeah. Wow. So you do that over the winter? Oh, uh, no. Winter, I log, snowmobile, hunt. Oh. It's springtime when there's no, you can't cut wood and it's too early to start digging. That's when the lawnmowers come out and we start tinkering them up. What, for people who don't live in an area where logging's big, why can't you log in the spring? It's uh, mud season. They post the roads, so you yep. can't drive big trucks on the roads. And the snow melts and the ground gets really soft. The, the, uh, the frost goes out and it's just the ground is soft. You can't do much other than go in the garage and fix equipment and tinker on lawnmowers and how long have you been logging? Uh, 30 years. A guy from your town got killed last year logging. Good friend of mine. Yep. Um, how'd that happen and how do people get killed logging? Well, generally speaking, people get complacent. Yep. Um, he was actually taught logging and um, he knew how to do it, was considered a, a considerable logger. Uh, I looked at the site. Yeah. He uh he went and cut another tree while uh, while a tree got hung, a tree got hung up. Yeah. And he went and cut another tree in the line of sight of that tree that was hung up and the tree fell. Yeah. On him and killed him. So he was I mean by reputation was and you just said like knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah. So do you ever worry about getting hurt logging? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You just, I mean, especially after that, um, you just, you don't take those chances. Yeah. But there's all, you know, everybody, everybody takes chances now and then, you know. So how did you end up living in a little town 
in Western Maine? Oh, well, my mom is from Livermore Falls area. She grew up in Maine. My dad, my dad was from all over the Northeast. Um, I was born in New London, Connecticut. We moved to uh, a little trailer park in Peru when I was really young. Peru, Maine. Yes. And then we moved to another small town in Western Maine. What town? Uh, Rumford Center. Yep. Very small town. Yep. And when I was 10 years, my father died when I was six. And shortly thereafter, um, my mom got remarried and we moved to Andover when I was 10. And I was disgusted. I actually ran away from home. Where'd you go? An old Girl Scout camp on the Whippoorwill Road, me and a buddy of mine. Uh, I ran away on my 10 speed and disappeared for a day or two until they finally found us, you know, and we were just... At that time, we were into Rambo, yeah, you know, outdoor survivalists and stuff. So we were going to, I don't know what we were thinking. I just was making a statement, I guess, that I, this town sucks. I'm from Rumpet, and I'm going back to Rumpet. Yeah, you thought Andover was bad. Yeah, it was, it was, it was not, you know, I didn't know anybody. Shortly thereafter, though, I found, I met two guys that, uh, you know, I consider brothers. Now, one of them's, one of them's gone to heaven. But yeah. uh, the other one, I consider a brother, you know, it was, it was the three of us, me, Mike and Mike. And we grew up together. And, uh, one of the Mikes died when I was uh, 19. Oof. Died in a car accident. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that changes you. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Did you stay in the town? Yep. And I did, uh, until I was 25. Where'd you go? Traveled all over the country putting in natural gas pipelines. Really? Yeah. Running from myself. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I was, uh, I, you know, I I played too hard, you know, work hard and drink even harder on the weekends. And yep. um, each town, I there were temporary jobs. You go into a town, you'd lay a pipe and you'd leave. And each time I go into, go into a town, I say, it's going to be different this time, you know? And it was never any different. Just the partying? Yeah, the partying, and it progressed. It yep. started just drinking, and it got into drugs, and just, you know, it was a time in my life when, at one time, I was going to I was gonna make a career of pipelining. Yeah. And then at 31, I sobered up, and I tried to keep pipelining. Yeah. I realized that it's just, when I quit drinking, I had to let things go. Let How, how'd you sober up? Well, they tr first tried to put me in rehab at 13, and I wouldn't go. 13 years old? Yes, yes. They wouldn't take me up to Bangor because uh, the doctor says, uh, the doctor was talking to me, said, I don't, I don't got a problem with alcohol. I love alcohol. And at that time, it was just, <laughs> it was, it was just, uh, it was just drinking at that time, I believe. Yeah. And then at 15, I went in and I spent, three, four days in detox because I ate too many Valiums yeah. and ended up in rehab for a month. It's a 28 day program on the 21st day I got kicked out. For what? <laughs> well, I had been reprimanded for uh, something. I don't remember what, but one of the ways they punished you was at that time you could smoke right in rehab. You know, yeah. Smoke. And uh, no cigarettes for you. So I was like, yeah, okay. And so I got in the line to get my daily cigarette or whatever it was a long time ago. And uh, got up the line, got the cigarette, went back to the smoking area. I had a lighter. I was just about to light it. And the nurse realized that I wasn't supposed to have a cigarette. So she bolted over to me and took my cigarette and said, you can't have that. You're being punished. I said, oh, really? And she's walking away. I said, take your effing lighter, too. And I threw it at her. And had I hit her with that lighter, I would have had to go to MYC, Maine Youth Center. Oh. I missed. Thank God. And uh, they booted me. That was the end of that. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Did you get a rehab again after that? Uh, 10 years later. Yeah. 25. 
and I checked myself in. I had a massive cocaine problem, and all I really wanted to do was quit that. Yeah. So when I got out of there, I stayed sober for a little while, and of course started back, and that's when I started pipeline. Yeah. I actually got hired. I got hired in uh, the paper mill in Rumford while I was in rehab. And I told them, I said, well, I'm in rehab right now because I had passed all their testing and they wanted me and they called me up, said, okay, let's come to work. I said, well, small problem. I'm in rehab right now. Oh, that's okay. When you get out, come on. So I did. I went to work for them. I lasted 10 days and quit. Why? I went back logging. I couldn't stand it. Yeah. It was inside. It was toxic. Yeah. All my coworkers were overweight and bald and unhappy. Yeah. And Do you think it makes you bald working in a paper mill? I don't know about that. I probably, yeah, that was probably mean, but it just, no, it just didn't look happy. You know? No, I agree. I, I was an outdoor enthusiast, you know? Yeah. And, and I just, so I left, you know, I left and went back logging. And shortly thereafter, I jumped on, they were laying a natural gas pipeline in Peru. Yeah. And I got hired on that. And that was a godsend. It yeah, was, uh, the wages were high. the 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 outdoor it was grueling. It was hard work and the mud and equipment and laying pipe across. Like, how are we going to lay a pipe across that? You know, it was a like a granite ledge or something. Swamp, yeah, river crossings, just unreal stuff. Tying crews, you know, is where all the prestige is on a pipeline. A tying crew, and uh, they're the ones who connect the pipes. Connect the pipes in the hard spots. Main line lays it in the easy spots, and the tie-in crews come in and connect the pipe in all the difficult areas, the swamps. Yeah. So, yeah, I got on that and started working that, and it was it was my thing. I loved it. I was going to make a career out of it. Yeah. And uh, I did it for seven years until I realized it was killing me. You know, not so much the work, but the the nightlife. Because with pipelining in a different town every six months came bar life. Yeah. Living in a motel and lots of drugs. and. Do all the guys go out together at night? Not all of them. Not all of them. No, there's, there was sober, good, hardworking, normal people. Yeah. But, you know, I I wasn't one of them. I was a party animal. And, and they liked that. You know what yeah. I mean? They liked you to work hard and play even harder. Man, uh, well, when you're working right hard, you can party hard yeah. for a while. Yeah. How did you end up stopping? It sounds like you've been trying to stop for like yeah, a long I, time. Yeah, I knew. I don't know. I I left South Chicago on a job, and I uh, headed east to another job. I quit one job, was headed to another. I wanted to make a change. And... Uh, when I got to the East Coast, it was either head south to that job or head home and try to straighten my ass out. And I was in trouble. I knew I was afraid. I was afraid my mom was going to go to my funeral. Wow. It was really in my mind, you know. And at that time, I didn't know I had a heart condition. <laughs> but you could just feel there was something wrong? Yeah. I was, I was living hard, you know, doing a lot of drugs, snorting a lot of cocaine. Yeah. Putting chunks of, you know, gram chunks of cocaine in my coffee in the morning. Does that work? work? You party all night, smoke crack all night long, sleep for 10 minutes, go to work six days a week, sometimes seven. Wow. It was intense. It sounds intense. Yeah, I made a ton of money. I had, at the end of it, I had my apartment, my, my room would pay, be paid, my truck would be paid. I'd had top hours of working foreman. Yeah. And they just throw money at you and. You try real hard, and I just, I didn't want to die. I didn't want my mom going to, the fu to my funeral because I knew it would kill her. So you've been to rehab three times at this point. Did you quit in rehab a fourth time? No. Really? No. By this time, I had been taught enough. I knew where the help was. It was a 12-step program that I had been to before. Yep. Uh, one Monday morning, I woke up, and things were different. I don't know. To this day, I don't know. What happened, but things just were different. I knew I was in trouble. Um, and instead of going to the store and buying beer, because that's what I wanted to do that morning, yeah. I woke up on my stepfather's couch. I was living at the time on my stepdad's couch. 
I, I had a pickup and that's it. I didn't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out. Yeah. So I, uh, I just went to a meeting. I went to a meeting that, that Monday night and I've been sober ever since. That's amazing. How long has it been? It'll be 20 years in March. Wow. How have you been able to stay sober all that time? God. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. I, I made a decision, you know, shortly after that. I met a gentleman. Um, he's deceased now. His name was Kip Cummings. And he became my sponsor. And he saved my life. I could relate to him. He was a grumpy old man. Yeah. And he was black and white. If you do this, you get that result. And I responded to that. He'd say, there are clear cut directions in this book and you'll get this result. And I've always been able to read directions and do something. You yes. Know? That's how my mind works. Yeah. Um, and it made sense to me. And he reminded me of like my grandfather or my father. Yeah. So I kind of, you know, I like old, mean old men who are, you know. You could tell they've worked hard. Yeah. And they've been through the ringer and I could relate to them. Yeah. I've always been around people like that. So he helped me. He just taught me how to become a man, how to stay sober. And and he he's he died a few years back. But he he, he just taught me how to be a grown up. Was he right? I mean, did your life change for the better once you got sober? Well, it slowly has. It's I'm in the process of changing my life. It's been a long journey. Yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> I quit drinking, doing drugs. I was straight up for a year and a half. And, and not everybody knows this. This is, this is, <laughs> but, uh, I couldn't take the pressure of life. I started smoking pot. Yeah. So it took me a long time. I, I didn't want to be, I felt like a hypocrite trying to help people to get sober, you know, talk at a meeting <laughs> and then get high on the ride home. Yeah. So I had a lot of hypocritical feelings up towards myself. But uh, March 13th, 2021, I was able to kick that. <laughs> what do you, so. Shortly after they legalized it. I was about to say, it's legal in your state. Yeah. What, what do the you. The worst idea ever. I voted no. Why? It's just not sending a good message. Yeah. It's just not. It's, it's, do we want to promote drugs? Do we really want to? Or do we want to just, I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I don't want to chase around a bunch of potheads and spend a bunch of money on it. Yeah. I also don't want to just have it be okay and be, I mean, maybe. You know all the tobacco campaigns that they have? Yeah. Why don't we have weed campaigns? Telling you. The, well, you tell me. I mean, you've used a lot of drugs. You smoked a lot of weed in your life. Yeah. Why do you clearly. It made me dumber. It put me in a little bubble so I couldn't relate with people. Yeah. It, instead of relying on my higher power, God, Jesus Christ, I relied on marijuana. You know, and before that it was alcohol. Before that was cocaine. You know, all the stuff. My higher power now is God. God, just the God, you know. That has evolved. It started out as, I, I wasn't a godly person when I quit drinking. Yeah. But I learned through a 12-step program and eventually through the Bible that that is the answer to all our problems, I believe, in my Yes. Opinion. Yes. I agree. So at, as someone who smoked a lot of marijuana, you mm. think it is bad for people? Yes, I do. That's an unpopular thing to say. Yeah. Why? Because people don't want to hear it. Yeah. They don't want to hear, they don't want to hear it. Um, I have a lot of successful friends that smoke daily. Yeah. So it's, you can't, if you don't ever see the insanity, it's like cigarettes. Yeah. Where's the insanity? It's easy to see how bad alcohol is for you. Yeah. Or cocaine or crack or heroin. But marijuana is so insidious. It's so mild. It's hard to see 
how it's holding you back. I mean, myself personally, I became a better businessman, a better parent. I can remember numbers now. You know, I can, it's just better. I'm not in that bubble. I can relate to people. I can, I can see people in Mills Market and start up a conversation with them instead yep. of running out the door because I smell like a skunk. Yeah. You know? <laughs> How, where did you get your politics from? I'd say my Uncle Esau. <laughs> your Uncle Esau? My Uncle Esau. I think that's a song, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, it's funny. I have never met another Esau except for people in my family. And then just the other day, I was listening to a podcast on the radio, and there was this dude named Esau, a black guy named Esau who was a pastor, and he's in, like, Massachusetts. And I was listening to Bible Thumping Radio, and this dude was on there. His name was Esau, and I was like, wow, that was amazing. The first time ever. What was your Uncle Esau like? He was a staunch Republican, free market guy. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. He, Where was yeah. he from? Auburn. Maine. Yeah. What do you do? He's still he's still in Auburn. He's a paver. Yep. Yep. My whole father's side of the family were all pavers. Really? Asphalt pavers. Yep. Cooper paving. There's a whole bunch of them. Yep. Bread to pave. Pave driveways, pave roads, pave parking lots. Yep. Pave. Pave, pave, pave. I worked for him for two years out of out of us. When I first got sober, I went to work for my cousin. Cooper Paven LLC. <laughs> And I lasted a couple of years and had to move on. Well, what happened, I bought an excavator to fix up a piece of land of mine. And it kind of evolved and I started getting side jobs. And I finally said, you know what? Screw it. I'm going on my own. That's how I became, that's how I got into the business. Do you like it? The business I'm in? Yeah. I love what I do. I don't necessarily like the business aspect of it. But you like excavating? Yeah. Okay. What? Why? I like taking raw land and creating something out of it. Yeah. You know, I can stand on the side of a road and look at the contour of the land. And some folks want it cleared and they want to put a house and I can see, you know, you can see, you know, how it should be and you get a vision and you do it and it's awesome. It's very rewarding. <laughs> I believe that. Yeah. It's kind of artistic. <laughs> do you, do you notice the difference between the town you grew up in, which you still live in, the way it was when you were a kid and it is now? Where the country... Other than there's a lot of people I don't know now. Yeah. As far as the politics goes, it's basically the same. What about the country you grew up in? How is it different? Ugh. <sighs> I'm distraught about my country. <laughs> Why? Because our freedoms are just being taken away from us daily what the what the federal government is doing to mr trump with the like political persecution and the what is it called lawfare yeah yeah it, it's just gross it's gross it's gross and i believe that this is what happened this country has turned from god and now we're cursed in a in this is what we got. That's my theory. Do most people you know like Trump? Most people I know? Yeah. Yeah. Why is Trump so popular in rural America? Because of blue collar workers. You yeah. We, we, there's very few educated elites, you know. And, and actually, there's a couple in our town, and, and they don't like Trump. <laughs> really? Yeah. 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 So it's a class thing as far as you can tell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have a friend. She's a lady. She's she's she was she she's a liberal. You know, she's 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 a progressive. She loathes Trump, and that's cool. We're still friends. <laughs> you know, I don't talk politics with her, except sometimes I'll just kind of throw in a little jab, like you know, just to get her goat. What do you say? Oh, she might try being. Um, she may, she may try to express, uh, how do I put it? 
a, a desire to be compassionate of uh, the gender baloney and yeah. stuff like that. And I'll totally state how, where I am, you know. I guess our recent card, I, she accused me of being a sexist. And I was like, uh, yeah, I am, I guess, a sexist. I, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what did she say? Laughed. You know, she knows me. It's all yep. good. But you sure she wasn't trying to say sexy? No, I don't think so because she's like 70 something. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but she's, she, yeah, I just think she's crazier than a shithouse rat. Yeah. And it's okay because there's a lot of crazy people in Andover. You know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, I weren't supposed to use that name. What what percentage of your town do you think will vote for Trump? I don't know, 50, 60. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's a bunch of people that just refuse to see the truth. I have a, someone in my family is all, hates Trump, going to vote Democratic, and he just, I'm not going to say his name, but it just, it's like, I if you go principle, if you stand there and you talk on principle, okay, we believe in this, we believe in this, we believe in this, we're just the same. Yeah. But when it comes voting day, check the Democratic box. How do you, so a lot, you live in Maine, which is run by socialists. Mm. Who are, oh. oh, you don't like the leadership of the state? I don't like our current Secretary of State. Yep, he got on the bad side of me. Yeah, you know, with the whole taking, trying, trying to take Mr. Trump off the the uh, primary ballot. But it does. It seems like that's very far away from where you live. Like it's a totally different world. Well, not if you. I watch the news. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this. If you watch the news, I, I I'm kind of a news junkie. I, I watch. So where do you get your news? Like what? Yeah, like you, I mean, you live, you know, hours from the nearest airport, so it's pretty far away, mm -hmm. right? Mm hmm Where do you, how do you find out what's going on in the world? What do you read? What do you watch? TV. Yep. I uh, I used to be, a, I used to watch a lot of Fox News. Yep. Matter of fact, I watched it as often as my family would let me. Yep. You know, i turn Fox on and my wife and my kids would be like, oh! here we go again you know because they, they just had it they don't want yeah but i i listen to the news two three nights a week maybe four so the day they fired your ass yeah was the last day i i have not watched 10 seconds of fox since they fired you have you caught your wife or kids watching nope just on principle just well thank just, you just on principle just because i just think it was wrong because it was obvious that they were putting pressure. You were telling the truth. In my opinion, you were telling the truth about a bunch of stuff and you got too close to the truth and they got radio. So that's just my thing on that. So where uh, do you now go? I go? Now I'm watching Newsmax. Now I'm a Newsmax guy. What do you think? Well, it's all right. It's grown on me. You go on the internet? No, not, not for news, no. What's your shirt mean? <laughs> this is a direct retort to Joe Biden's speech that he gave last week where he basically called all Trump supporters domestic terrorists. Yeah. Okay. Let's brand domestic terrorism as cool. <laughs> huh? That's what I'm saying. Because I, I'm a Bible-thumping, hard-working, blue-collar, you know, I got a few guns. I'm no gun expert, but I got a few. You know, I hunt fish. I will die for my country. Oh, that's a good story. I tried to go into the service. Yeah. I scored like in the 99 percentile on my ASVABs. I believe it. My junior year. So my senior year, and I was all advanced entry or whatever you call it, right during Desert Storm. So I was all enlisted my junior year. My senior year, this general... Company, Where'd you go to high school? Telstar. Yep. Bethel, Maine. My senior year, this general comes in. And uh, he wants to get inside my head, see what I'm good at. I'm like, yeah. So I get in the room with him, and I start being honest with the guy. 
I told him what I had going. I wanted to get out of here. I want to change my life. I, I told him I had, you know, I was partying and, you know, I was honest with him. And at the end of that meeting, he's like, we, we don't want you. <laughs> Why? Why? Because of the, you know, the partying, the drugs, the, the drama, the, you know, yeah. He didn't, it wouldn't take me. So their loss, you know, maybe, maybe I, you know, maybe that was God, you know, maybe he didn't want me to go because I might have popped. Yeah. You know what I mean? Might have got in there and tried too hard and just exploded on the thing and I wouldn't be here sitting with you, talking with you, embarrassing my kids and what? <laughs> wow. Um, so you partied too hard for the U.S. Army. Yes. Yes. Yeah, they wouldn't take it. I was honest. I didn't realize I was supposed to lie. If someone would have said, don't tell the guy that you don't tell him about your personal things. Just say yes, sir. No, sir. And no one told me. I just I told him what I had going on. <laughs> it was my ticket to ride. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to go straighten my life out and be somebody. And he's like, no, we don't want you. <laughs> Did you, so obviously it changed your view though, because you did leave for a while in the pipeline, but then you came back yeah. to your town. Are you happy that you did that? Yeah. Well, mainly because my mom, she's aging Yeah, and I live a thousand feet from her now. And that's why I live in Andover. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found a few cool places in the country that I could have stayed at, but, you know, but I, I basically came and lived where I live because my mom my i have two sisters yeah one's deceased one's still with us but they had moved away one lived in new york one lived in virginia uh and she you know my my mom and my stepdad were getting age up there in the age and i felt obligated to come home and help them live out the rest of the years are you glad you did oh absolutely absolutely yeah what do you think of the cities now well, it's atrocious. It's atrocious. I, 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 I don't even know what to say about it. It, it. They've gone so far, crazy town, that you know the real estate prices in our town are stupid now because everybody wants to get out of the city. Yeah, they're all moving up this way, and you know, with that's good for business. But don't bring your friggin' laws with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't mind people. I like people. I actually do like people. Yeah. But I don't like their rules and regulations and all that. It's, it creeps me out. It does. Do you think they'll bring them? Oh, most likely. You know. One thing you can count on in life and that it's going to change. Yeah. And that liberals are going to show up and wreck everything. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Maybe we'll have to move north. You know, maybe we'll have to. You live pretty close to Canada already. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I had a cool story about Canada. <laughs> what is it? We I went to Canada on my 18th birthday. We yeah. Went to Sherbrooke. Yeah. Went to the, yeah. And had a really good time. That's all I'm going to. Did you wind up in jail? Can you go back to Canada? No, but I should have gone to jail. But I didn't get caught. Just, hey, anything related to cows or what'd you do? Give no, us no, hint. no, no, just uh, a bad parallel parking job and uh, intoxicated behind the wheel. Nothing too serious. Yeah. I think you can parallel park any way you want in Canada, I think. Is it okay to move the vehicle and take the spot? <laughs> not if it's not your vehicle, it's not. <laughs> no. Yeah. It, uh, there's just been so many, there's so many things that have i i have a lot of lives i i not so much now you know but back in the day i am lucky to be alive well now though too though you're sober and you're going to church and you've got a family and thriving business and everything the ride right on mower racing and then stock car racing yeah 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 so have you ever you've had like just let's start with the ride on mowers have, you've had mishaps right yeah what happened? Crashed, got hurt a little bit, and just kept doing it. 
You know what I mean? You just make ten don't hurt. And yeah. I don't I don't know what happened. I mean I got bum knee, bum arm, bum neck. But that's not just from that. That's I've t I've crashed and smashed a lot on a lot of stuff. Like what? Snowmobiles. Back when I used to drink, yeah. I wreck a snowmobile every winter, just basically every winter and have to get another one. <laughs> uh, on on trees? Trees and rocks and brooks. And a lot of people and... people in Maine die in snowmobiles. People die on snowmobiles, yeah. I can't believe I'm not one of those people, actually. So now you race at a big track in Oxford, Maine. Well, I used to. I did it for two years. Yeah? They got rid of the trucks this year. They canned them. No more trucks racing at Oxford this year. Why? I don't know. But so... My wife never really liked it, so I'm just kind of going to back away from it, you know. You had a pretty bad crash, though, didn't you? Uh, yeah, but it, it didn't hurt. Yeah. And it was really cool. I got out of the truck and did a bow, and the crowd loved it. What, what happened to your truck? Nothing. I mean, it dented, it dented it, but broke some uh, bent, bent spindles and broke a few rims and smashed the windshield. And, but my stepdad... In his garage with one leg, fixed it in a week. We raced the following week. Really? Yeah. Yeah, while I worked. Yeah. At That's the end of the day, I'd go there in the evening, and he'd be pounding and smashing on. He'd be all bloody knuckled. And got it ready. And we did it. We went, we raced again. And the following week, I did it again in practice. And that was embarrassing. That wasn't cool like the first time. The second time was embarrassing. What did you do the second time? We were in practice, and a guy came underneath me and poked me. And I spun sideways and rolled like four times, did an endo and crashed. You did an end over end? Yeah, I don't know. I didn't see it. But they told me, <laughs> they told me if last week's crash was an 8.5, this week's was a 10. That's what one guy told me. So I was like, oh, all right, yeah. But it wasn't, it was embarrassing. This time it was embarrassing. So when you're in a vehicle on a track at high speed and it's going end over end or side over side, what are you thinking? Please stop before I run into something. That's what I was thinking the first time when I was barrel rolling. I was barrel rolling down Victory Lane. Yeah. I was like, Ugh. it was like, it took forever. You know what I mean? And then when I came to stop, I was on my roof and I'm like, oh, okay. So the lady came over, she said, you all right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. So I put my hand down, I could smell gas. I put my hand down and it was all wet with gas. So then I'm like trying to freak were, out. Were you, were you smoking? No, no. But I was afraid, you know, one little spark. You know, the truck's hot. You've been yep. racing. Oh, yeah. So there's, a, there's a chance of fire. So yep. I kind of got a little nerved up. Yeah. And I couldn't get my belt undone because I was kind of tripping out a little bit. And finally, when I got done, I went smash down on the roof. And I got out and I was all covered with gas, but there was no fire and it was all good. And I got out and I was a little discombobulated. And I turned towards the crowd. And I did a bow, and they just went nuts, and they loved it, and it was awesome. I was your it. wife there? Nope. I think she wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just ask you finally about Trump, mm -hmm. more, a little more specifically. Okay. So I asked you what you were mad about in America, and the mm -hmm. second thing you said was they're, they're persecuting Trump mm -hmm. on political grounds. What do you like about Trump? He tells it how it is. He's pro-business. And he's anti-swamp. What do you mean anti-swamp? In our government, there's a bunch of people that all they do is keep making the government bigger and bigger and bigger to give themselves jobs. They have a budget, and they make sure they, have to, they spend every penny of it so that they can get more. Instead of trying to save some money, because they're all worried that... They won't get as much in the next year's budget. So they spend every dime, every year, all the time. And that's what happens to bureaucracy. Job one of a bureaucracy is to make itself bigger. And Trump recognized that. And he, he tried cleaning it out, tried, tried making it work right, work like a decent business. And they, they, that's why they hate him so much. That's why... The left hates Trump is because he was trying to make our business, our, our government honest and work for the people, beneficial to you and I, you know? Yeah. 
he wanted to do that and he exposed the lies you know what i mean he exposed the the corruption and that's why they're doing what they're doing to him could you imagine how successful his presidency had been if he'd uh, if he hadn't had all the pushback by the left by the by the powers that be by the press imagine what we could have got done in the past because it would have been eight years he would have got elected the second time if it weren't for the press yeah i and that's another thing i i lay blame to them they they, there's no free press anymore there's they're not they used to be they used to hold the politicians accountable now only if you're a republican do you get held accountable if you're a democrat you just ignore you you know make only talk about it's it's so oh drives me up a wall if trump was here what would you say to him i'd shake his hand i'd ask him if he was looking for any help and then i tell him he's got my vote in the fall I wouldn't bother making any suggestions on what I think he should do to win because I know he wouldn't listen. That's about it. You saw Cooper. (laughs) It was great to see you at lunch. Yeah. And I'm glad you came. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm humbled. Well, I'm humbled that you would come. Yeah, it's uh, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Well, thank you. Hey, it's Tucker Carlson. The internet is crowded with interesting things that don't really matter. On TCN, we attempt to bring you interesting things that actually do matter, and a lot of them. Interviews, long form and short, videos, documentaries. You can find all of it on tuckercarlson.com, and we hope you will. Free speech is bigger than any one person or any one organization. Societies are defined by what they will not permit. What we're watching is the total inversion of virtue. 